educational technology specialist session. What is it? How many people here have educational technology in their degree, in their, in their degree, in their uh, title? Okay, or in their job duties, I should say. I don't, but it's in my job duties. Okay, a good, good amount. Well, let, let, first off, let's introduce ourselves. I'm Barbara Glennon from California Western School of Law. And my uh, co-presenters here are Denise Sharif from Boston College, um, Irene Good from Suffolk, and Christy Dickerman from Elan University School of Law. Okay. Uh, a little history on how the idea for the session came about. Mostly out of a need for information, my employer was looking to staff um, an educational technology position but they didn't know how to do it. They didn't understand you know, what kind of background the person should have or even the types of job duties. So they just added this, these duties to me and a colleague, um, which is fine. And I thought, well, you know, because we're comfortable with computers and we've taught, and so we should be able to uh, assist faculty with any of their educational technology needs. So the first thing I did was try to go out and I thought, well, there must be a group or a group of educational technologists in law schools that I can go to to see how they do their jobs and to exchange information. So, you know, I, I looked around, I couldn't find anything, and then I would meet people who were um, ET, ed tech at law schools, and I found there really was no um, method of communication between people for this, or this, uh, this position, this type of information. So uh, somebody suggested, why don't you do a session on Cali? I thought, okay, but I don't really don't have anything to say. I'm looking for information. Uh, so what I did is sent out an email on Technoids, and um, my co-presenters volunteered to help out with the session. And what we did is we put together a survey. We thought we'd start with a survey and try to collect information ourselves on the educational technology positions across the country, how they're staffed, what their job duties are, what the educational background is, and that type of thing to get the ball rolling. So at this session, what we're going to do is present the results of this survey. And we have these slides and a file with job descriptions as well on the Cali webpage. Try to determine, you know, use the results as maybe talking points to see what you all think to determine if, you know, maybe there's some best practices or hear what you have to say. Um, and then hopefully, uh, develop a method to exchange information in the future. Either regular meetings, or perhaps um, a website, or um, some type of social, social networking software, we can, we can talk about that, so we can exchange information on this topic in the future, regularly, either electronically or in person. So, before Christy is going to present the results of the survey, the first thing we want to do is thank you for participating in the survey. We know that many of you who are here uh, took the time to fill out the survey, and we really appreciate it. We wouldn't have been able to do this without you. So next, Christy is going to start talking about what we found. I know originally one of the goals was to make this conversational so that we can gather information if there was something not covered in the survey. So if at any point you feel you want to chime in with information from your school, please feel free to do so. We had 410 stop by, browse at the survey, but only 110 completed responses. But for 200 law schools out there, 68 responded. So that is a great turnout and we appreciate it greatly. But we only took the completed responses only. We found that 80% of the schools have at least a part-time position. I had no idea that there were schools that didn't have a position, because mine has always had it. About 12 to 20 hours a week is spent assisting faculty for those people. Granted, during the busier times of year, for me, August, I don't know about you all, when they're getting ready for school to start, is typically, you know, you get those waves. There's always quiet times when summer, when they leave. It always gets quieter, so it just depends on the workload. The job descriptions we handed out for you all, it's also on the, tech, uh, the Cali website. Newer positions say that they're going to be reevaluating those job descriptions. And for me, a lot of stuff falls under 
other duties as assigned. <laughs> so I know that that's how it falls for Barbara. It's not technically her job, but it's, hey, you can do this. I like that. <laughs> Could you also do this as well? I have stuff like student payroll. It has nothing to do with technology. I'm just comfortable with it. So most of the job descriptions fit the position. A lot of people said, yeah, you know, it could be reevaluated to, to meet the current needs, but it's an ever-changing field. So I think the job descriptions will always be evolving. For those of you looking for getting a position, the feedback was immensely positive among most people. We tried to highlight most of them. The faculty love it. They love the one-on-one. -on -one. They love having someone at, at my school at the back end call. They go, oh, you're here. Five minutes. You can be here. You can help me. That'd be great. Um, it allows them to become more comfortable with branching out and using technology. A lot of my faculty wouldn't do it if I wasn't there to hold their hand, so to speak. You know, so I, they're using more technology, which our students appreciate more. Okay, well, I flip. The problem is that some of them have too many duties. So people who it's kind of an add-on, I flipped too early, sorry. Um, they find that they're pulled in a lot of directions, so they may not be able to dedicate enough time to the position as they normally would. So it, that is also another pull for, you should have an educational technology position at your school so that somebody can be dedicated for that need and there for your faculty. Most of the positions are fairly new, um, pretty much within the last five years or so. I know mine is only three years old, but again, so is my school. So that makes it easier. But <laughs> as the professors get more comfortable with using technology, I think there will be a greater need and we'll see this number grow even more, hopefully for us, more job security. Um, the reporting structure, a lot tend to go, the majority go to either the law school IT, if there is a designated law school IT department, um, or the law library director. A few to the law school dean, a few go back to the main campus <laughs> library. I know I have somebody at my department, we have two people. I report to the dean of the law school library. She reports to main campus IT. And then there's you know a spattering of other people. There's associate directors. There's the marketing director, which that one kind of surprised me. Um, assistant director for educational and library tech. So it just depends. I think a lot of that varies on specific law school titles. So probably similar positions, but just different titles at different schools. Not many supervised staff as a majority. It's mostly the, um, you know, they kind of just go on their own. A lot do supervise students, though. That seemed to be, and everybody, who, when we asked, who, who is it that they're supervising? It tended to be a, a, a good handful of students. I know I have about five, but no professional staff under me. Um, and then others had, they oversaw the help desk and the technicians videographers, um, if the school had media services, some had, they oversaw that department, or the AV coordinators. So that is the end of mine. It's just a general overview. And now, Denise, sorry, Denise. Good morning, I'm Denise Sharif from Boston College Law School. Um, I just wanted to talk about the educational requirements, and some of that was also derived from my co-presenters because we all have um, some very different backgrounds as well. I think what we found from the survey was the majority of people tended to be in the library or associated with the library in some way, um, but if you happen to not be, and I know one of my co-presenters is not, then you'll see that that's slightly different. So I just wanted to talk briefly about our the degrees that we had in our backgrounds briefly. Um, just to sort of put in a little bit of context. I do have a law degree. Um, I also have a master's in international relations, which, he which helps me with this position, not at all. Um, and I'm also currently getting uh, my MLS degree, which was a requirement when I took the job. I've only been in the job for about a year and a half. Um, did you guys want to just briefly share what your backgrounds were? Um, I also have degrees that aren't related. I'm an MBA student, so I just happened into the technology field. I'm not students, I have it. Thank God, I have it school. And I have a JD and a library. And I'm so 
similar to Barbara, JD, MLS. And you'll see um, some of what I think this particular slide may not capture quite as well as where people sort of do have the bowl. So you see there's a lot of the JD, there's a lot of the MLS, um, a little bit less with the ed tech. And I, what I was surprised with was sort of the other, not necessarily the advance of the professional degrees. So that's what's on the right hand side. Some people just having um, the bachelor's um, experience in higher ed, ed tech settings. Um, things of that level. So like I say, it really is varied and, and you may know from yourself, um, you know, what the degrees that you hold, what the, the varying um, different degrees and backgrounds are for it. <clears throat> um, do the education requirements meet the needs of the position? O overwhelmingly, it seems like yes. Um, I, I think, again, maybe what that needs is a little bit of context in that what we found from the survey is that in addition to sort of the educational background and or the experiential background, a lot of the responses to the survey said it really depends on the person. Um, you know, whether they got along well with IT, what their personality was. So I think it really was much more of a combination of sort of the person themselves with the particular degrees that they had. And again, I know that, you know, I, I can speak from personal experience that that's true going into my position. Um, I didn't have my MLS, but yet I'm a reference librarian, I'm a lecturer in law, and I'm also the educational technology specialist. So I think, again, going back to one of the, the points that Christy had made is that it really does have to do with sort of what you fall into, what, um, you know, how, how people like you and things of that nature. Um, collaboration with central IT, we saw that some people work very closely with the IT department, some people much more with the library, depending on where they were. Um, again, overall, overall it worked well. I think this goes back a little bit to the personality of the people, how do they get along, but definitely the overwhelming majority did collaborate with um, the central IT department, which I think would be necessary, I think as especially once we get to one of the slides sort of covering the expanse of what the ed tech person does. Um, does the collaboration work well? Again, we just thought it was interesting to pull out some of the comments that people made. You know, the first one, yes, but you know, some territorial issues, which I think you know people are probably familiar with. Um, sometimes different goals that each department may have. Um, Sometimes it's a struggle, depends on the person and the circumstances. So I think, does that, does that sound familiar? Does that not sound familiar to anyone? Um, territorial issues and uh, different personality types and how that sort of works out. Does anybody have any comment to this or anything they wanted to, from personal background? You, you, don't, you, you don't have to say your name, but, but, that, but that's, um, that's a comfortable, those slides are comfortable for everybody, those comments? <coughs> So top ed tech responsibilities, and again, please, you know, some of the stuff that you may do, as Christy said, you know, I do payroll. Well, where does that fit in the ed tech world? Probably not so much. Um, we just tried to really extract the four sort of major headings, and we're well aware that many other things fall under there. But training faculty on software and hardware, uh, troubleshooting that software and hardware problems, the pedagogical training, and distance education support. Um, you know, the first two may in varying degrees, again, depending upon, you know, what it is that you actually do. Are you with the library? Are you more in with the IT? I know with my position, I don't do quite as much of that troubleshooting. I'm really just getting them setting up, you know, set up and trained. And if they have those major technical issues, I get to pick up the phone and call somebody else and, you know, sort of pass the buck. Um, the pedagogical training, I think that can be somewhat troublesome. Um, simply because it's really difficult, I think, to go in and tell a professor how to teach or how to change their teaching. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that sometimes what they may or may not understand about really introducing technology into the classroom is that it, they can't just necessarily take the same old thing that they've always done and just, you know, sort of plaster or technology on top of it and go about yeah. in their normal course of business. Sometimes they do need to change the way they're doing something, the way they're presenting something, or the way that they're gauging something. Does that make sense? Is that, um, and I think that ties in nicely with the distance education support because again, I think it's, if 
professors want to get into distance education, again, sometimes you can't just take the same old course they've been doing, post all the documents up on your course management site, and move along on the day. Things have to change. The methods of assessment, of evaluation need to change. Um, the way that they're collecting data, the way that they're engaging students, I think, needs to change as well. Um, and like I say, I think that that number three, the pedagogical training, is something that people doing the ed tech really need to know about, be aware of, so that we can translate that successfully to the professors so that they can really learn how to incorporate technology, like I say, not just use it as sort of, um, you know, a film over what they're doing and then be like, oh, look at me, I'm using technology. Denise, that's something um, actually that I would love to be able to get information from other people on, on it, if you have any. And I think that is what the <coughs> technology education focuses on, the learning theory and the technology. And that's where, at least with my background, I, I kind of have an intuition, but not the formal. I think the problem is if you have an educational background, sometimes the technology, that gets buried in, and you're focusing on the technology, and IT is focusing on the technology, yeah. the professors are focusing on the technology, and you really want to focus on students. Well, I think that might even be where sometimes <laughs> what we've termed sort of those territorial issues is, is that sometimes, you know, if you're looking at the educational technology end of it, you might have really a different ultimate goal than IT, who just wants it to, to really work well and to, you know, they want the professor to utilize it and we want it to be utilized well and for a main purpose. And that's why you ask the questions, well, what, you know, what are you ultimately looking to achieve? So I think sometimes that might be the issue too. I really think that it's really the goal I believe of an educational technologist to really to, to bridge that gap and to you know to really you know in one hand you're holding on the faculty member on the other hand you're holding the hand of IT and bringing that together so bringing bringing together uh, working perfectly seamlessly along with being able to implement educational perspectives with that I think that that's what needs to be the focus I think sometimes there's I know it's an emerging field. There's just too many. There's too many separations, and you know people are looking for ways to pigeonhole it. Mm. When you can't pigeonhole it because it's really something that's that's new. The technology is driving so fast that it's creating a divide, and you need to have someone or some way to bridge that divide and, and make it smooth and seamless. I agree. I think that should be the goal, and I think maybe in the back of everyone's mind, maybe it is. But I, I think that's also the obstacle, as well. You know, how do you accomplish that you know and again I think that goes back to the you know that whole territorial issue um, how people get along with each other how, you know how do you approach the faculty member without saying to them you're teaching wrong you know what I mean and this is this is how you can change the way you teach to make it better that's probably not going to be received um, too well I mean do you have any is that something that you've encountered or experienced do you have any you know pearls of wisdom to offer us that, <laughs> that, that we cannot say to the professor you're teaching right I had the good fortune of using clickers with somebody who actually not only had her JD but her master's in education. So when I was showing her how to use the clickers, she taught me how to use them more effectively mm. by telling me that when the students gave their response, she wasn't immediately going to tell them which was the right answer. She would then go through and say, so it's say, say 15 of them selected A, she'd say, for those of you selected A, and let's say A was the correct one, why did you select A? Somebody tell me why. So she actually, not only did they select it, but then she wanted them to say why it was the right answer, putting it back on them. And then she'd go through B, C, and she wouldn't go with the wrong one. She wouldn't make anybody who had gotten it flat wrong, you know, say why I got it wrong. And then she'd go through, okay, that is the right answer, A is the right answer, and the reasoning they gave was the best one. So she made it more interactive, and she didn't make anybody feel bad who had gotten it wrong. When I had the opposite experience, I felt like, they were wanting to use it and pop the graph up and I was saying, what, you know, the whole purpose of this thing is that you want to come up with discussion, not just show the right answer. What if you don't show the answer right away? And, and it was kind of like, wow, light like bulb type of thing. And it made them want to use the technology more because they saw it not as technology but as a teaching tool. Well, that's, mm -hmm. what, I, that's what I'm saying. Well, I, I, everybody I trained like, after like, that. There was something that told the technology that they were ready to click it and hit the button so the graph would pop up because the they were afraid that it wasn't going to work and that they changed the procedure. But when, once they get comfortable, they forget all about it. Yeah, 
Yeah, everybody I trained after that who I explained what Professor Keller was doing in her class, they loved it. They went with the same model and they really thought it was a better model than other. And I think that's a key thing, is if you have some faculty member who's adopted it, it's easier than if you're telling oh, sure. this is what you should do. <coughs> So and so found success with this. So pit them against each other? <laughs> People will recognize in their college, but they may not recognize that some they don't see as their college. Well, and that's what one of the law professors in a session yesterday had said. You know, he was like, unfortunately, every once in a while, you know, they don't see you on their level, and so they don't want to take the advice from you. And so if you can just get that one professor, and I am tempted just to get him to drive over from Raleigh to talk to my professor, <laughs> you know, to do that, it then the rest will be more likely to follow. Oh, I, I'm just going to comment about, this is an important example about having a good relationship with IT about yeah. being strong with boundaries, is I, I found that our, our classroom support, desktop support people, is this admin. Everyone works really hard to keep everything up and running and keep all our products top shape, but that's the biggest hurdle, is if you're showing somebody something new and it doesn't work the first time they use it, you've lost yeah. them. Right. So that's why it's so important to try to keep really good relationships with and, and you know, stay on top of what's going on and, you know, just stay close with IT and not get too separate or large just get trained on this, you know? So, it's because it's, it's really hard. Once somebody tries something and it doesn't work for them the first time, they don't feel confident. Mm -hmm. It's so hard to try to get them to do it again. Anybody else? Please. I just wanted to comment. Um, our position, we have the, our, our media specialist is also our educational specialist. Um, and he's very good at you know, teaching the faculty how to use the classroom equipment and making them comfortable in the classroom with the equipment. Um, but we have never been successful at actually training our faculty using some of these tools in the teaching. And I think part of that is because they don't understand the teacher's perspective. And, and I think that um, you know, hearing everybody and, and seeing some of these descriptions um, where that position is tied in with the library, I think, makes a big difference. And your position is not? Our, our position is not strictly IT. And so I think, you know, I think there's a, a problem there as far as getting that I was in the same session um, that, that Christy was in yesterday and listened to the professors talk about you know, the professor's feeling like, um, you know, you're just not credible when it comes to teaching them about how to teach. Mm -hmm. So um, I think there's the, the bridge idea is, is important that we try to figure out how an IT person can bridge that, that gap. I wonder if that makes sense, just because, again, from the institution I come from, um, you know, I happen to be one of the librarians. All of the librarians have faculty contacts, and I also happen to be the ed tech, so I sort of span all the faculty as well. I mean, with the bridge, I mean, maybe does it make sense for you to collaborate more with the librarians? If, do they, I don't, if they have a structure where they have sort of faculty that they deal with, if you have the IT coupling up with the librarians and they're sort of introducing it to them that way. I mean, that, that might be another connection that you know, might make sense for people who don't necessarily have that, you know, formal library, um, you know, go through. Well, we are working on restructuring our department anyway, the IT department, um, and this is giving me an idea, you know, about that. Kind of working with the library. Good. Good. Yeah, I, I just, I wanted to, um, to comment on that. I, I agree with uh, not understanding the, the perspective and uh, faculty having a different perspective. Not necessarily, you know, having the educational perspective in mind. Um, in the history of uh, the, the institution that I'm at, actually, uh, we have we have an IT department within the law school that is kind of, kind of a little bit autonomous. And its history was it used to be with the library, and then it branched away. Um, and so, really, we found a way to where the educational technologist position has to have more of the IT background coupled with the educational background. That's the coupling that we decided to make. And by doing that, that time, every time you go to show someone something, the equipment is going to work. 
because you 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 know it's it's that you know top down structure where everything it's a call you know you know what you're going to be using in a demonstration you know how you're going to be using it you know the best way for it to use and you know every single problem that you could possibly have with that um, I think sometimes that that libraries you know they're they're, they're getting very large I, I think that. Uh, <laughs> And uh, they have a, a tremendous number of responsibilities already built in, built to, built within the library. Um, and I, I just I don't know if, if adding on to that bureaucracy it is you know the, the best solution for restructuring. Well, and for me, I mean, I report to the library, but it's essentially only an organizational. But luckily, my team is very supportive of me, and that's an advantage I have. But when it comes to needing things or trying to get faculty buy-in, I still need to go to the dean or the academic dean of the law school. So it's kind of a weird branch because a lot of times it would just be adding the middleman if I went through the library to get there. But when I can have more direct contact with the faculty and whichever dean happens to oversee the faculty, that has been where I've gotten the most effectiveness. But I think it just depends on how everybody's library conversation you can see that there is definitely you know and then the job descriptions that we handed out there's definitely a lot of diversity out there and sometimes I think that makes it difficult and I think you know when Barbara started this process and said you know where's the edu educational technology group that I can go to you can sort of see why it's been um, you know it hasn't sort of been preformed prior to this point but I think it's been really enlightening to see the different backgrounds and the different ways you know the reporting structures and things like that um, so again, just some of the other, you know, ed tech responsibilities, again, certainly not an all-inclusive list, but just the things that we probably all do. Um, you know, keeping up with new technologies, a lot of the positions we saw were actually termed, you know, emerging technologies or emerging technology librarians, um, working again with the faculty on their scholarship, support for staff and or students. Um, a lot of people seem to have that AV under their sort of guise as well, whether it was in your job title again, I luckily do not. Uh, that's, that seems like a whole nother full-time position to me, quite frankly. Um, project management, support for you know, PDA and home computers, again, luckily I don't have to do that either. Um, special event type things, which again seems to fall under a lot of the AV time, uh, web development and programming. So, you know, it's a pretty full-time, all-encompassing, uh, you know, job responsibilities potentially under EdTech that can be out there. Um, we just asked with, with you know, when, when we went back to the, sort of those four big buckets of, you know, what did we do, the software training, these were just sort of the various softwares that people were actually doing sort of specialized training on with their faculty or what they were using in their law schools. Um, so I'm not going to go to that again. This is posted up on the, the Cali site if you just wanted to get some ideas of what other schools and other people were using. And this is the same for the hardware, what, thing, what people were using out there, the clickers, the audience response systems, printers, microphones, um, things of that nature. Um, I can't imagine that this slide would come as any big surprise to most of you. If it does, I'd like to hear. Um, faculty training, what, you know, how is it most effective? Where does it tend to take place most of the time? Again, 74 of the people said in, on an individual basis, 15 said in a group setting. Um, there was also some combination thereof where sometimes an initial training might be offered in a group setting. Um, but then usually follow up with individual. It, it, does this, again, does this slide really surprise anyone? Does anyone have more, more success doing it in a different way? Because if anyone has any ideas about how to actually get those faculty into <laughs> the big group, I'd love to hear that. The only thing that's really worked for us is um, we have a faculty development series and all the faculty are required to go to a certain number each year. But they have to go to these lunchtime seminars made outside speakers. So when we can get our programs into there, we're more likely to have people come, but otherwise. But does individual, it still yeah, seems Otherwise, more. it has to be individual. Um, 
food. Does that yeah. actually? <laughs> that really does work. Well, I'm protected. Um, <laughs> it gives it gives all the our that our staff so if you offer breakfast, lunch, cookies, whatever, they are there. And they need to uh, one of the programs I think uh, we've had success with is uh, we call it uh, faculties, faculties in Teaching Technology. And so we take those those sort of flagship faculty members that we've trained on specific items, assign them to a particular classroom, and then we have an event where we invite all the faculty, rather than IT getting up there and talking about anything, <laughs> uh, we say, you know, go to the rooms that you, know, you are going to be teaching in this semester. There's going to be a faculty member who's taught in that room. They're going to show you how to use it, you know, and so that's, that's been successful. Yeah, we have a show and tell at the beginning of every year that, you know, I'll get up and I'll do an intro on, here are a couple of cool new things that you could use, and then I bring in faculty members who are actually using them. And so even though there's a big, large group of both our full-time and our adjunct faculty, they get to see, so I mean, even the symposium mm -hmm. Um, we just also took a look at course management site usage just because we thought that seemed to be one of the main things that the faculty were using. Um, so the way that this reaches is more than 50% of the faculty, so 53 out of our total responses were actually using it. Um, and then it goes down the line, sort of, tw you know, 12% had about 50% of the faculty, um, eight, it, you know, had about 40% of their faculty, et cetera. Um, so quite a, quite a few, uh, over half of our responses were using some sort of course management system. So we didn't really specify that could have included um, something like Blackboard, it could have included TWIN, LexisNexis web courses, or even an open course system if that's, um, open source rather, excuse me, system that some of them may have been using. Was that it? Was that you, Irene? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, Irene's listening to the beautiful mountains of Boulder. That's my definition of cloud computing. You <laughs> 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 haven't gotten to the Rocky Mountain National Park? Get there. Is that from yesterday? That was from yesterday. Yeah. And that scares me a little bit, Kevin. I'm from the East Coast, and I just want to run away from that and go towards the water. But. Um, <laughs> and then when we asked sort of if they were using course management systems, what were they using it for? Um, so more than 50% of them were using it to post more than just a syllabus and documents. So what does that mean? Again, we didn't really get into really deep specifics, but maybe that meant they were posting videos on there. Maybe they were putting assignments on there using di things like digital drop boxes, things like that. Um, but you see that the majority of them, about 10% of them, basically used it just as sort of a stopping ground to put their uh, syllabus and to just post the documents that they were probably already handing out in class. Does that, again, any big surprises from these particular slides, this information that we gathered? Any comments about any of that? The only thing I'd add is the reason we were, I was interested in this sort of question is, um, you know, we have, we have plenty of room to grow. So anybody who thinks that, you know, on one, we also ask, you know, how many of you are actually using the learning management system? And that is over 50% or more are using the learning management system, but then how many of them are really using it for teaching purposes versus just posting the syllabus? And so when I look at that contrast, I go, we have so much more, more work we can do. There's plenty of work for us. We're guaranteed employment going towards folks. <laughs> I feel good about it. Do you have, it would be interesting to know if of those, 50%, which ones had instructional technology people? Yeah. Is there an instructional technology person on site and then does the 
usage increase mm. related to that. Yeah. Hi, Irene Good, Suffolk University Law School. Um, and just I have the last few slides here incorporating technology during class time. Again, we can see here the correlation that there's not a whole lot that are doing things during class time. So as I just mentioned, there's plenty of room for us to grow. Um, I think one of the places where we could go further with the survey, and that's one of the things I want to talk about at the end, is um, what technology or what projects are people actually doing or in the classroom? Because I think all of us are looking for ideas and how we can inspire our faculty. So I think one place where we fell short with the survey was actually trying to delve into that, but maybe next year's survey, because I think there should be a follow-up, but you can tell me whether that's right or wrong um, to clarify some of these points that we're making here. Um, and then student usage requirements, I was also curious when we were at, coming up with the questions, how many of them actually assign um, things that where the students actually have to go online or create some sort of multimedia presentation. And you know, it's not something that a lot of law, school, um, law schools would require, but I'm sort of interested in seeing how um, the technology is being used and how students are being asked to engage with the technology. And uh, you can see that it's, you know, the highest number there is a 10% or anything less than 30%. Um, are using or assigning technology. And I don't know what that means, you know, Westlaw and Lexus at this point, which again, we could sort of delve into further to get a better um, idea of how the technology is being assigned to students. Um, and really, this is why we did this, why Barbara started the whole uh, survey and started us out on Technoids trying to gather us together. Um, we're looking to connect other ETs. Not quite that ET, but <laughs> other educational technology specialists or educational technology people. Um, and when we think about that, we're, we're trying to figure out what's the best way for us to do that. Is it, you know, Cali and having a space within Cali for educational technology people in law schools? Is it the website that we could have a special website that was separate from Cali? Uh, social media sites, and once we're talking about using Facebook to collaborate, um, a wiki, or regular meetings at the conference, something like this one, more of a birds of a feather where we opened it up to discussion. Um, and, you know, any suggestions from all of you if you think it's worth, you know, continuing, doing a survey again next year um, and coming up and with better questions that really pinpoint some of the uses of technology in law schools or you know, what sort of other suggestions you might come up with. Um, we really want to open it up at this point for all of you um, and your ideas about what, where we should go from here. And I think comments, ideas, questions, that's our last slide. So thank you for coming and um, yes. Something that just occurred to me is that um, what I'd like to know more of is what do the students want? What do they, what do they want from their faculty in terms of what will help them to learn? Um, because when I, when I talk to them, the number one thing that comes up from them is they want me to, to record the classes more for them and make that, that available to them so that they can, they can study the same thing later. Right. Um, and that's not something that we're doing right now, not, in, not on a regular basis. Um, but I think that kind of information, you know, coupled with what you know, the faculty are, are willing to do and getting trained to do, I think, you know, makes, makes good sense. And I don't know how to... I get that, that in a real, you know, um, in a way that is consistent between the schools, um, but it, it, it might be a good thing to, uh, to look into. I do a survey of my students at the beginning of every year uh, on a series of questions. How many of them have PDAs? How many of them, you know, have wireless? What they're, you know, what they're using to connect to the web? Things like that. But I don't see why we couldn't collaborate. Maybe come up with a series of questions that we all think we could ask our students and then those who are willing to send it out to the students and then have get their responses collated, we could probably do something like that. Absolutely, good idea. Yes? I'm, I'm actually from the UK, so I'm in a slightly different position, but I'm curious um, how much uh, of these students are actually demanding that we're engaging with them in their technologies, as it were, and how we sort of engage with our faculty to introduce them to the students technologies that are like Facebook, Twitter and stuff like that. Because mm -hmm. um, I think what we find is that we're happy pushing our technologies to our faculty, but are we actually asking, again it comes back to this question, are we asking students what the technologies they're using and are we 
addressing that. Right. right. I'm just curious what people would. Anyone? What do you think about a format for communication? Is that, is that positive? <laughs> or something, I don't know, but, but I think it would be a great idea to have some kind of communication where we can communicate as a group. We were thinking of asking Kelly to, um, I don't know if they do this, to maybe create a web page and then we can link Facebook and turn it over to it, but just a <coughs> place to go. I don't know what kind of comment. Does anyone know if they can do that or uh, have done anything like that? What's the question again? Uh, we were thinking of asking Callie itself to maybe give us a space on the website to communicate, so be like our home base for EdTech. No? I don't have an answer to that. Oh, <laughs> does it sound like a good idea? Yes. It's a start. So we can just do an RSS feed like Tech Noise, that's specifically for us. Right. Yeah, and, then our, and we could, you know, adapt other whatever we want to. Yeah. And just be a home base. And then so that, you know, you can post questions and you can all go there and look at it because nobody has time to, to do much more than that most of the time. I have a question um, regarding the list of technology that uh, and hardware training, either one of those. Uh, would people be interested in, uh, I don't know if people create their own documentation on these and if we had a central location where we had like one or two examples where these uh, of what we had created if you know so if somebody was looking for how to train on trial director which I know I've seen and people have mentioned to me but I have not I have no idea how to train on it but if somebody else has already trained on this and has directions that they've created yes. it's up there it doesn't have to be for everybody it can be for your school but then I could take them and then modify them based on what I needed um, so if we had an area where we posted those things, as well as the RSS feed, people seem to be interested in that as well. Y'all are more than welcome to come to the UT University of Texas Law School website. We have a lot of documentation. Right. I have, and <coughs> I can send it out to anyone who wants it as a documentation on SharePoint and everything. We have our own little X site where our faculty can go. All right, we're just going to take their site, <laughs> copy it, and put it in our site. No problem. <laughs> I want your card and after this. <laughs> great. Great. That's exactly what I'm looking for, a place where we could all central a central deposit. A twin site? A twin site? Yeah, a national twin site. Is that some people are no, some people Now wait, does everybody does not everybody use a twin though? Yeah. I mean we didn't use yeah, the guy from England is <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's what we're thinking, actually. How about just Facebook? I don't know how to mix my Yeah, that's what we, we also talked about a wiki, yeah. We thought that maybe the, the Cali site might keep it more permanent, more ongoing. Yeah, yeah. that's actually a good idea. Because otherwise they have to have Facebook and other We can still do that, but it would be an addition. <laughs> and Cali may not like it. So <coughs> that it would be a book. So we'll do that, you know, between the four of us, uh, kind of you know, try to get that done. Yeah. We've, we've posted the presentation. It is on the Cali website under our um, uh, presentation description there, as well as the job description list. I'm really sorry, I only carried 20 of those printouts with me, but the Word document is linked off of the Cali website, so if you didn't get one, you can get it from there if you want to see how others who gave us the job description described it. And we've got some really complete ones, and then we've got just paragraph descriptions that were sent to us as well. Someone had made the comment of our faculty make a point of pointing me 
came out when when they tour other faculty. And they do the same thing at my school where they come by and they say, this is our technology department and Christy will help you with anything, so Rita can fix anything. So if it becomes a bragging point, it's even more incentive to get, you know, the faculty they're really striving to get at their school and it just might help to maybe get that position created. Well, if there's any other comments, please feel free to add them. If not, um, thank you all for coming. We really appreciate it, especially at 9 a.m. on Saturday morning. <laughs> We're pleased with the